Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp. I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for attending Database Now Online, the first occurrence of this online conference produced by Data Diversity. We're very excited about today's event and have already heard some great presentations and continue to have a great lineup of sessions for you. And of course, a special thanks to all of our sponsors today to help make it all happen. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the event. For questions, we will have a short Q and at the end of each presentation today, and we'll be collecting questions via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DBNow. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. For this event, we will send a follow-up email next Monday to all registrants containing your unique login to access the recordings and slides from today's presentations. Now let me introduce to you our keynote speaker for today, William. McKnight, who will be discussing selecting a data platform in 2017. Just to give you a brief background, William is the president of McKnight Consulting Group. He is, in, he is an internationally recognized authority in information management. His teams have won several best practice competitions for their implementations, and many of his clients have gone public with their success stories. His strategies from the form the information management plan for leading companies in various industries, and William is a mentor in information for a startup accelerator and taught at Santa Clara University, UC Berkeley, and UC Santa Cruz. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's keynote started. Hello and welcome, William. Hello, Shannon and everybody. Thank you for that. And uh, congratulations to everybody, really, for the wisdom in taking time out of your day today to get some great education here. Um, uh, the speaker list is impressive, and I'm proud to be among them. And uh, uh, and without further ado, I'll, I'll launch right into my subject here because this is a lot of what I do, uh, selecting data platforms for our clients. Not outright selecting them, maybe it's recommending, maybe it's creating the, the process by which a selection will occur. Uh, that has to be mobilized. Uh, every client's a little bit different. Every one of you is a little bit different in terms of how you approach this subject. But I want to give you some uh, knowledge for that for that process, and I think all of you probably would have heard about all of these platforms I'm going to talk about, but maybe seeing them here in one place will help spur some of the proper activity around platforming your data uh, out there today. So, okay, that's a little bit about me. I think we got my, uh, my bio down there. And... Top performers realize they need data. I think this is a foundational principle that everyone in data must adopt. If you don't believe this, then maybe this is not right for you because we need to be pushing data out to our clients internally as much as they're asking for it. And I know that's hard when you're underwater and maybe the, the requests are more than what you're able to deliver right now. But that's a good thing, right? That's the, uh, you have more uh, more demand uh, than you have supply. And I want to keep you in that situation, frankly. Uh, maybe not to an overwhelming degree, but we have to be leaders. Uh, we, have to, we are sitting on the gold asset, really, of our organization. We're sitting on how our organization is going to compete and get competitive advantage and really sustain or not over the next decade. It has to do with data. All strategic objectives of your company can be supported, if not outright solved, uh, with data. And so uh, they don't always know all the possibilities, but uh, you do, or you should. And we're going to expand that envelope a little bit today because, like I said, the top performers realize they need data. And I've done some maturity studies otherwise, and uh, I have noted that the highly mature with data companies are the highly successful ones in the marketplace. There's a strong correlation, actually. And those industries that are doing more by data are actually doing better than the ones that are not. And the companies within those industries, obviously, that are doing more with their data are doing much better. Like, for example, big data. You've been staring at this, uh, this little study here uh, for a bit. Uh, that's one of many, one of many out there. The average performers are thinking about big data, but the top performers are expanding their big data implementations. But we've got to platform this data correctly. 
And we have to have the mindset of, let's give them all data fast and effectively. Uh, I've lived through all three of these pillars that you see here, many of you have as well, but hopefully we've moved our mindset past. Just give me some data and give it to me fast. Give me good data, but do it efficiently. And now it's give me all data fast and effectively. And again, if your user community, if your applications community are, is not asking for data, that's a problem right there. Uh, they need to be asking for data. We need to be helping them ask, if you will. That's the leadership. And so I will always uh, leave that out there. I think that uh, leadership goes a long way in this business of data. But we're here to talk about platforms. So there are three major decisions when it comes to platform today. Uh, there used to be fewer than this, I'll put it that way. And those of you that are doing the same old, same old with your platforming decisions, the same old, same old that you've been doing for the past decade, really it's time. It's time to think outside the box and time to do something differently. I can almost assure anybody that would be on a call like this that you have problems in your organization that can be fixed with something other than the one or the two or even the three that you've been kind of rotating maybe for the past decade. There are other possibilities out there and I'm not trying to overload you with technology. You know, take on these 12 platforms, not necessarily, but t today's world is we got to get the platforming correct for the workload. And part B to that, we got to make it all work together with data integration, data virtualization. I'll come back on that a little bit later. But those are the two big things. It's not about the data warehouse, for example, being the center of the universe. Everything goes in it. All processing happens there. Didn't, we didn't quite achieve that, and we've, we've really backed off strong on that, especially since our warehouse is typically on our database, and we have these non-relational platform possibilities today that actually have a lot of value proposition for you. So the first decision is the data store type. Do we want a scale-out system, a file-based scale-out system, or do we want a database? Yeah, it used to be everything was a database. Uh, that was the default. That was clearly what we're going to do for everything. And we can loosely call these scale out systems uh, databases if you want. Uh, but technically, down at the bit and byte level, they're not databases because they don't have the same framework around the data. They don't have the same data page formatting and stuff like that going on. I'll come back on this a little bit later. but. There, this is a solid decision that you need to make in terms of what's best. And I, and I will give you some pointers as we go along. How about data store placement? Emerging over the past, I'd say, five years, we have a real viable possibility here to not necessarily put the data store into our data center, you know, w w that you can walk over there and touch and feel and whatever. It's the cloud option that's very viable today. And I'll come back on this, too, because there's different clouds. Um, so that is definitely a major decision. A third major decision, and we're starting to lose sight of this, but we should keep it in mind is, is it an operational workload or is it an analytical workload? Now, I know you're thinking maybe that, uh, well, these are blending together and, you know, the, the lines getting blurred, maybe a tad in my view, but there's still distinct, there are still distinct workloads. And that means distinct platforming solutions for operational and analytical workloads. There are, they are architected differently to support those different architecture, uh, different workloads. So these are your three major decisions and three is a nice number for a slide, but uh, heck, number four decision I would put up here is the, the split between HDD, SSD, and uh, uh, in memory, um, because we are starting to be able to exploit a lot more in memory uh, these days. So that's becoming much more prominent in the decision making process. So it's not about, okay, you know, what have we been done, doing for the past few years? Let's just do that again for this new workload. Let's think about it. At some point, you've got to stop and think about it and bring some process into that. Maybe you, maybe you get one or two, the next one or two wrong, but let's start building to where you start getting them right because it has a lot to do with success of the platform, of the application, and of your business. Now, this slide's a bit of an eyesore, especially when I just kind of, you know, put it up here all at once um, as opposed to building it. But my point's not to go through all the details on here, but to show you in context that there's a lot of different platforms that make sense inside your organization. If you're a mid-sized organization, 
uh, if that's what you call yourself, or above, obviously. Um, yeah, a lot of these platforms are going to make sense. So you need a good data architecture. You need a good data architect, you know, one that is looking out for this, it's, that knows what I'm talking about here today in detail uh, across the board, understanding the cloud dimension to these things, understanding what the value proposition of a multi-dimensional database is versus a data warehouse, which would, which would be a relational database versus Hadoop, versus a columnar database, which might be your data warehouse, maybe not, and then there's in-memory databases. So having a tiered architecture, especially on the analytical side, is very important. And knowing what platforms fit in the same tier, that's pretty important as well. So here's a little e exercise for you. I like to do this to my new clients. Come to a meeting and uh, give everybody 10 minutes and a blank sheet of paper. Let's sketch out our data architecture here. And uh, you can, you know, if you haven't paid attention to data architecture, you can see some pretty weird stuff coming back and some pretty disparate stuff coming back. And I like to see some, even if it's bad, a bad architecture, I like to see everybody on the same page because then we can start moving forward together. So that's a pretty important exercise. Let's sketch it out. And uh, obviously, we got to start building towards what our future architecture is going to look like. Now, on the operational side of things, over here where you see NoSQL, some relational database, legacy sources, operational applications, and so on. We have master data management. That's pretty important for your so-called enterprise dimensional data. And it's pretty important that that be in the operational side of things, not over here in the data warehouse. So master data management, although I'm not talking about it a lot today because we don't put uh, large amounts of data in there, it is great for mastering, I shouldn't use that word, but for uh, organizing the uh, data of that, that is so important throughout your enterprise, your customer list, your product list, and so on. And I'll move on because I'm going to zoom in here on the data warehouse and help you make some of, those, some of the decisions around that ecosystem as we go along. But further on this theme of data, our information is exploding, our business is real time all the time, and if it's not or you say it's not, you need to work on that because your competitors other businesses out there, the possibility exists for you to be real time all the time as well. And we got to get there. Our information differentiates us. Our information quality impacts our clients. I'm not spending a lot of time here on data quality. I know some other speakers have. Yeah, that, that is very important throughout everything I say, throughout all the platforms I'm talking about, all the data you're putting in there and pushing out, it's got to be of high quality. And that high quality, by the way, and I'm sure the, the other speakers talked about this, but it needs to be, it needs to come from the business in terms of, you know, what the rules are that you're measuring that quality by. We call that a data governance program, right? So one of the first things I want to do, no matter why I'm at a client, is to lay down a, at least a mini data governance program, something we can build on over time, but something where I'm going to get that business input to what I do. Because I do want the requirements coming in although that's not the only criteria I'm going to use to platform a workload, and we'll get into that. So we're in the business of data, and we're all measured out there as data professionals. Our success is measured based upon a finite set of things. Obviously, 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 user satisfaction is very important. User satisfaction in our work, giving them what they ask for. Yeah, that's all part of it. But many of us stop right there as if that's it. We've, we've done our job, check the box, we're done. Today, it's important for a data professional to also spur business ROI and growth through maybe data projects, maybe ideas about applications that are in place today, for maybe bringing more analytics, maybe bringing machine learning and artificial intelligence into some of the things that we do as a company but bringing ideas to the table and taking them for than just the idea, but starting to lay out some plans to get to some higher planes uh, in terms of data maturity. And finally, we are measured on data maturity. And what is data maturity? Is, this, is, is it some ephemeral thing that you know, we just, we just uh, sort of talk about in academic circles? No, it's about long-term user satisfaction and business ROI. It's about being efficient. It's about creating an efficient environment that we can add on to without starting all over again every time. And obviously, many, many companies are doing that with their data. They don't get any leverage out of what they've built before. 
to starting all over. You can't do that for very long. So data maturity, uh, and I have a whole presentation on that. This is not that, but it is a thing, and it is something that's well worth you measuring, knowing where you are, acknowledging that, acceptance being the first step to change, right? And, uh, and starting to get on a path to grow that because that will be highly correlated to your success and to your business success. And then, of course, there's other things that we're measured on that I won't get into here. But don't forget about our obligation to our business to bring ROI and maturity. Too often we focus on BI. We focus on the tip of the iceberg that's above the waterline. We're not focused enough on the data platforms. Uh, how to... Um, how to, how to get real leverage is to focus on the data platforms. You should be able to put any BI tool on top of a great data platform that has data that has been put into the proper platforms, and you should be able to get value out of that immediately. The data, if well done, should be screaming out, hey, here's what to do with me. I'm telling you what to do with me. You don't have to get in here and do 10 steps. Uh, obviously, you know, we'll get more sophisticated as time goes on and uh, we'll figure out what, what else we need to be baking into our data infrastructure. But for today, many of us are upside down in terms of where our priorities should be. So let's bring it back to our data platforms. When I'm platforming, I want to know the data profile and I want to know the usage profile. I can get a lot out of the data profile, though. If you can tell me, you know, the size of the data, the profile of the data in terms of you know, is it structured or unstructured? What some uh, some sample records, what do they look like? How frequently is the data coming in? Where's it coming from? How frequently does it need to be accessed? What's the quality of it, et cetera, things like that. If you can tell me that, I can pretty much say without knowing, you know, the usage pattern of that data, where it belongs in an organization, because a lot of organizations over time, at least, they grow their usage capabilities. They grow their desires for what they want to do with the data. So to platform it correctly, you got to look at the profile of the data. And too many of us are just looking at the usage profile. And I'm telling you that the data profile says a lot about where to put that data. If it's unstructured, big data, and we're into Hadoop in this organization, you believe, as I do, that Hadoop or whatever that you know ecosystem matures into is going to be around for a while, uh, that's where it belongs. That's where it belongs. And the data science of your organization will grow over time as we make more data available. You see, one thing I do with my clients is we look at all data in the organization and we say, is it under management or not? And how well is it under management? If it's not under management, that means that the data is happening, but we're not storing it. It just happens and it goes away. It's very operational um, and maybe too much, uh, too much data is actually going through that process. But if you're, uh, like, let's say you're highly mature with that piece of data, it's not only under management, it's in the best platform for it to succeed. And by the way, you can do this across the board with all your data. Is it under management or not? You still wouldn't have done the full job because there's all this third-party data that you can utilize as well. It needs platformed as well. And so, really, the, there's not a lot of boundaries around what data you can use. The only boundaries are your imagination and your data science. Because when you talk about third-party data, there's a lot of data available. So as we make our data platforming decisions, we are obviously trying to get success out of the workload, right? Okay, so what determines the success of the workload? Performance is number one. Provisioning. How quickly can you get it up and running? That's the world today. How agile is it? Scale, can, it, can I start small and grow and not have to you know, monkey with that process too much? And cost, of course, of course cost. We don't want to overdo the cost part of the equation, right? But performance can override a lot of things. If we can give our users better performance out of our platforming decisions, they can grow in their capabilities with the data. They're not going to be limited because, oh, this query is going to take five minutes and I've only got a half an hour here, so this is, you know, I'll run a few of these and that'll be it. They'll get to deeper levels if those queries are popping. And uh, that's not going to happen if you do the same old, if you haven't thought about it for a while. So I'm encouraging you to think about your platforming so that you can give your users performance, quick provisioning, 
high scale, and relatively low cost. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot. So there is an increasing probability that platforming selection leads to success. Again, I keep saying, same old platform, you might as well be throwing a dart against the wall in terms of whether you're going to have success today. I know I look at our portfolio of deliveries over the past few years, the requirements have gone up tremendously in terms of the number of users, the performance expectations, the amount of data, the complexity of the analytics, and so on, right? Isn't that you too? Well, we need to think a little bit differently. We need to get into the best category. For example, if it's Hadoop, it's Hadoop, okay? If it's for Hadoop data, um, that's the best category for it. I didn't say that well. Um, if the data profile says, put me in Hadoop, then the category is Hadoop. Now, there's obviously different distributions of Hadoop. If you get it into the right one for you, and there is a right one for you, you have maximized your probability for success. If you get that wrong, you still got a pretty good, uh, pretty good odds of success. But there is an increasing probability that platform selection leads to the, the success as I've defined it. Now, what about cost? What I've, I did is I looked at our, the POs that we've uh, solicited for our clients over the past few years and looked at cost per gigabyte or terabyte or what have you, storage uh, level, and I cross-referenced that with the functionality and value, which is obviously much more subjective. Now, don't take this to say uh, that speaker said put everything in a graph database because it has great functionality and low cost. That's not what I'm saying. There's a place for all of this in your organization. But, you're going to, but there are some things that are more specialized. These are the things that, uh, that, um, that these platform categories really tout. Like, for example, in memory, super fast performance. It's, it's unparalleled in terms of versus everything else on here. Now, is that important? Sure, I just said it was important, right? But is it important at all costs? Are you going to get that exponential uh, value uh, out of it? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. So for selective workloads, you will. So it has high special functionality that you're not going to get anywhere else. Master data management, mastering that organizational uh, metadata, if you will. Uh, yeah, it's specialized for that. It's specialized for that. So that's high functionality. Then you get to things that don't give you a whole lot extra, like Hadoop, but it is very cost effective. And obviously, it's going to grow in its capabilities. But Keep in mind all these possibilities, and we'll drill in here a little bit. Now, let's look at the data warehouse ecosystem, something that's been near and dear for me, you know, for a couple decades now. So we got that source data stuff going on over there. Obviously, that's a complex ecosystem in and of itself, but we want to bring that data over into analytics, right? So there's the, there's the good old data warehouse, and it's sort of, uh, I don't mean this in a disparaging way. We need a data warehouse, really. Um, pretty much uh, every client needs to put more energy, more, more uh, dollars really into their data warehouse and they'll get more back out of there than just about any place else in the company. You know, that's still where we are with data warehousing. However, however, it is sort of the lowest common denominator in many organizations. And what I mean by that is you already have 10 workloads in there, 20, what have you, however you want to count that. You got a lot going on in your data warehouses out there. I know that. Well, it gets hard to add another one. It gets really hard because you've got this committee basically now going on that you have to impact, and that slows things down a bit. Like, who's going to want to step up and say, okay, yeah, I'll jump in on paying for that, that in-memory database, uh, making our data warehouse in-memory, that is, or, or I'm, I'm good for, you know, if you want to take a weekend and spin the data warehouse to be columnar or move it off SQL Server, move it into an appliance. Yeah, I'm good with that. No, that doesn't happen. So the data warehouse becomes kind of a bottleneck in some cases. Now, that being said, it's probably best for about good, a good 80% of your good old reporting requirements. But I want you to get away from just good old reporting, all right, and get into some other things. So at the same level of the data warehouse, we've got Hadoop. Looks pretty big. It can be big. It's not necessarily bigger in importance. But for many of you, Hadoop is going to be by far much larger than your warehouse in due time if it's not already. And then you've got other appliances for specialized workloads. Like I said, I've got some very specialized requirements now that I haven't had to deal with for uh, quite a while. So exponential uptake in terms of performance expectations, concurrency, et cetera, 
you may or may not get that in whatever you put your data warehouse on five, 10 years ago. That may require a separate uh, appliance, if you will, maybe. Uh, and obviously we have our data mart layer. And some of you are looking at this going, but my data warehouse is on an appliance. Yeah, that's cool. As a matter of fact, uh, no two shops are the same when it comes to this. I am only saying that the interplay here between warehouses and marts and maybe some, uh, some, some marts at the same level as the data warehouse and Hadoop should look something roughly like this. All right, we try to bring our clients usually more complicated architectures because of sprawl into some sort of uh, architected fashion and it would look like this. Moving on, uh, you want to consolidate to right fitting, right fitting platforms. And so within the data warehouse, you've got the data warehouse, you've got these oldies but goodies, they're still relevant. And for younger folks that aren't exposed to some of this, maybe this theory of behind data warehousing, it's still relevant. Data marts, I've talked about that, an operational data store, a staging area, an analytical application with specialized needs. So the point of this is, if you have a sprawl thing going on with your data, even though we're trying to platform data correctly going forward, you might want to rein in some of that sprawl that you have and put the databases into their right context and their right utility within your organization. If it's really a staging area, not a data warehouse, Let's quit calling it a data warehouse. Let's call it a staging area. And then let's build a data warehouse because we all need one. And data warehouses belong in, on relational databases, okay, to be sure. But what about some specialized workloads? Okay, in-memory databases. The benefit, speed. Speed, 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 all day long. And also that op speed just opens up the possibility of doing more. Doing, doing whatever you're trying to do on a limited set of data to all data. And hopefully that opens up many more possibilities for return on investment from this platforming decision. So the considerations are really what data to put in RAM, what processing to do in RAM, how does the solution handle fault tolerance, and how will it integrate with other systems? So without going into you know, the architecture of these in-memory databases, I'm just saying that you probably have a workload or two that's you know a single digit number of terabytes let's say but it has performance expectations off the charts and in-memory databases could be a nice solution for that got to make it all work together of course but uh here's some hardware perspective on that ssd yeah here's some rules of thumb to walk around with your mileage may vary but we're a, a lot of uh people out there are still uh, hooked to their HDD. This is that fourth decision I was talking about earlier. SSD and memory, yeah, that's sort of the way to go. Without reading all the numbers, that's sort of the way to go. And so really open up your mind a little bit or open up, open up the possibilities here to what more memory can do. Not, I'm not talking about an in-memory database here necessarily, but just using, of using more memory than ever before because of the lower cost that it now uh, has for us and uh, the demand for performance. I always want, I want the wind at my sails when I'm making these platform decisions. I'm not wasting money, but if there's better performance to be gained, it's not ridiculous to think about, I want to do it. And I want to do it because I, that puts the wind at my sails, gives me a little more room for error as we go through our design process. Let's think, oh, maybe a little faster, which is pretty important as well. Not that we don't need a great design, et cetera, but, uh, I just like that wind at my sails. Now, when it comes to cloud, that's that other dimension of the selection. And this, is, this looks a little messy, but cloud architectures can be that way. You might have, for example, just honing in on the data warehouse side of things, you might put your data warehouse in the cloud. Well, what about your BI? Might you put them in the cloud? What about source systems? What about data integration? Could that be in the cloud? What about MDM? Could that be in the cloud? Yes to all of the above. Now, is that right for you? I don't know. Let's, get, let's, let's break that down here in a few slides. But I do know that the possibilities exist for all to be in the cloud and all to work together in the cloud. And many are making the decision today that their data gravity is in the cloud. Maybe it's third-party apps. Maybe it's software as a service apps that they are particularly, you know, kind of circling the wagons around as, as key parts of their company. Well, that's in the cloud. 
And so maybe other things in the cloud wouldn't be so bad as well. And where do we start though? You know, I say start with the data. Now, every client's different. Obviously, we have on-prem data warehouses with cloud BI, with cloud data integration. We've got it all going on, all, all of the above, right? Uh, but when a client gives me Greenfield, we're thinking hard about the data, starting with the data, putting the data into the cloud, and the other things will follow. And I think uh, a mature architecture not only has some cloud, but has a lot of cloud in it today. Those are the leading organizations. They figured out a way to make it work. Now, there are different cloud models, and it's pretty important to get into the right one for you here. Now, private cloud, and, and I kind of um, have to put quotes, I should put quotes around that, actually, because uh, the term is sort of thrown around pretty loosely. Got to know what you're talking about. I think we all need the benefits, the true benefits of the cloud. And if you're getting that from your private cloud, that is great. If you're getting elastic scalability, if you're getting rapid provisioning, if you're getting great chargeback, if you're getting access to a wide variety of resources, then good for you, great, keep on doing that. But so many so-called private clouds don't give you all that. that they, they used to be the system administration group, and now they're exercising more control and I guess giving themselves a different label. Not to be too cynical about things, but if, you, if done well, a private cloud gives you control because it's yours, gives you the ability to customize. You don't have to worry about you know if, every other client on this cloud. Um, gives you data residency that you can localize as good as possible. And it gives you perhaps false, but nonetheless trust in your IT organization. And the cons of this are the CapEx, part of this, obviously pretty important. You got to bring your own DevOps to the private cloud. Yeah, that's a big uh, con to it in my view. You got to bring your own uh, 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 backup and recovery, uh, et cetera. And I think it can be a con to place a lot of trust, maybe misplaced trust in your own IT versus that of a cloud. So that is, some, that is you know, an equation to really look at and many are looking at that uh, very intensely when they start to make their decision about private cloud versus public cloud. Now let's talk about the public cloud. We know what the big three or four or five are, right? Uh, pros, true cloud benefits, all the things I mentioned before, you got it. Scalability in spades, provisioning very quick, operational expensing, software as a service applications, you're already there, great cloud gravity going on, sharding across, the world into all the resources of the public cloud if you need, if you need. And a big one to me is the DevOps. All the non-functional requirements, the availability, the backup and the recovery, the performance, etc. Now, cons with the public cloud. Sprawl, so easy to get into. Anybody with a departmental budget can be getting into that and creating sprawl. The long-term cost studies have shown that the long-term cost of the public cloud, if it carries out from today linearly into the future, would be prohibitive at some point in the, I'd say, you know, upper single digit numbers of years. I don't know anybody thinking too much about that because some think that it, that will change and it will be, it will be actually long-term cost benefit to the public cloud. But stop, with, stop at that point because if you're just thinking about the storage cost, that's not enough. That's not enough. You've got to think about all the pros of the public cloud. So are we leaning that way? Yeah, we're leaning that way for a lot of things, you know, if, uh, if uh, the workload dictates that. Now, there's also hybrid, and the pros and cons really depends upon where you are in terms of exploiting the benefits and the cons of the private cloud and the public cloud, because hybrid can be all over the place. But one use for a hybrid cloud, which I found pretty interesting, is cloud bursting, which is using the cloud resources as a failover, if you will, or as a peak workload type of uh, resources that you can bring to bear, you know, that late in the month when you have the, you know, the, the, the mass of processing or whenever. It's tricky to set it up that way, but many are exploiting that benefit of being hybrid cloud. So, Cloud models, it depends. Think about public, don't write it off. Distributed file systems. Now, this is 
what NoSQL databases, so-called databases, and Hadoop clusters are. They are distributed file systems. Some of us have been around long enough to remember the older file systems pre-database, pre okay? Yeah, it's kind of like that. And um, you got your data blocks that are spread out across your nodes, which are low-cost commodity computers with everything built in. But the, the, the value of the distributed file system is it makes it all work together seamlessly. Now, there's no RAID and stuff like that. The blocks are spread around. And if a node goes down, which does happen, one of the secret sauces of these things is that they'll pick up a new node that might be in the same IP range as these nodes. And obviously, as you can see, it can restore all the data. <clears throat> so there is a separate a piece of understanding to have about how this platform works, such that if you are contemplating platforming a new workload, can you live without the benefits of a database, which has an ID map on the page and references to where the records begin, much better at random access and things like that. So distributed file systems, definitely lower cost but maybe not as uh, good on some of the DevOps and some of the other things today. Hadoop is a distributed file system. It is the quintessential distributed file system. There are many patterns that make sense, some before, some after the data warehouse. We particularly like the data lake, and we are architecting data lakes for our clients and finding great utility for them when the client has great data scientists or an emerging data science program, I'll put it that way. And if you don't, you probably should. You should work on that. So it makes sense in that data science lab pattern for you. But some of us are using it as a data refinery, which is you know, taking off some of the ETL workload, which is great. We use it for that as well. Some of us are using it at the back end of a data warehouse or other systems to archive off some of the colder data, get it on lower cost platforms where it's still available. It's much more available than tape. Okay, so Hadoop is better than tape in this context. And uh, it's so much more than that, but you know, it is, it is uh, meeting that pattern quite a bit. As a specialized application store, one that needs all your unstructured big data, your sensor data, your clickstream data, uh, your social data, your server logs, your smart grid data, your electronic medical records, videos, pictures, geolocation data, etc. All this data, all this data belongs in Hadoop. Uh, where most of my clients are, where most of you guys are, I think probably is you got one or two applications going on for that data. And so it's not exactly a data warehouse. It's a specialized application store. We'll learn more to do with that data but we might be summarizing some of that data off, bringing it back into our relational database data warehouse, which brings me to my final point. Hadoop is a data warehouse. I'm gonna just quickly say no to that idea and move on to the data lake. Now, I'm not gonna go through the architecture of a data lake here. I talked a little bit about it. And uh, one of the nice things of a data lake is it can serve a dual purpose. It can also be the staging area for your data warehouse. But it, it can be so much more than that. Once you get your data scientists involved, it actually becomes the place where, of course, you've got big data, but you have all data that the data scientists can utilize because this is their playground. Now, I like to stay one step ahead of my users. I like to understand exactly what they're going to do with their BI, et cetera. I like to offer them data on a silver platter. I have not figured out quite yet how to do that for the data scientists. And I don't think that they want me to. They want access unabated to all data. And this would be the place for that in the data lake. So we're having fun architecting the data lake and putting that in that ecosystem. Now, there's also NoSQL data stores. Some of you may have been waiting for this and thinking, well, when's he going to talk about that? Isn't that pretty viable? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. You've got key value stores. You've got columnar stores. You've got document stores. Okay, they're all twists on the same idea. These are scale-out file systems for uh, unstructured operational big data. And here are some of the use cases for that personalization, profile management, uh, catalog management. That's a big one. Getting that customer 360 view 
in play, in real time, that's huge, et cetera. A lot of these things that you see on there. Now, I can't forget about graph databases. Now, if your workload that you're thinking about platforming, if you would describe it with the words network, relationship, uh, object even, uh, properties, you know, these are sort of key words to me that say, oh, we might want to think about a graph database here. And I, we think of sort of the quintessential one of these is like Twitter with everybody connected, et cetera. Well, uh, the, 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 the nodes, so-called nodes in the graph, don't have to be homogenous. They can be heterogeneous like you see here. We've got people. We've got cars. We've probably got other things. Graph, graph is great for that as well. As a matter of fact, if, if you need super high performance, even if it's not, you know, a complex web of a billion nodes, uh, you may consider a graph database. And finally, here's your saving grace, if you will. Here's your catch-all for in case you made a mistake otherwise and you put data into the wrong platform or you spread it around maybe a little bit too much. You got data virtualization. If you, if you accept what I'm saying here today, that many platforms are viable within your organization, you need the capability to do data virtualization because you're going to have those cases where you got some data over there on Hadoop, got some data in MDM, maybe some in your warehouse, you got to bring it all together. Are you going to physically move that data? Maybe for the long term, but for the short term, I know many are turning to data virtualization to get those reports out, et cetera. You need this capability. Now, some of you are going to work in some queries into data virtualization to be just sort of normal, and that's okay too. You don't want to overdo it, but it is for those edge queries and for some things that you architect into this pattern, and it's for that catch-all because, let's face it, we can't put all data everywhere just in case. We put data in the best place or two sometimes to succeed, and that's it. So sometimes that's not enough. So you've got all your traditional selection vectors for selecting a data platform. Here's some new ones. These are not, to your, not your table stakes anymore. Table stakes, yeah, do that. What kind of indexes do you have? You know, what's your SQL, et cetera. But robustness of SQL means more than just, you know, which SQL version do you have. There are some newfound capabilities within SQL that makes a lot of sense for you, which I don't have time to go into, but, it's, but SQL is still very important. Built-in optimization across the cloud, across data virtualization, the optimizers have to do a lot more work today. We've been keeping them busy, and we're going to keep them busy. On the fly, elasticity. We talk about elasticity. Do you really have it? You need that. Dynamic environment adaption. Are you going to be able to take on concurrent usage, different patterns of usage at the same time? Eventually, a lot of data platforms will go there. So that is something to look at. Separation of compute from storage. Very important for the cloud, so you can scale those two things independently. That is great. Support for diverse data because obviously we have it today, JSON, XML, other forms of unstructured data coming right down the pike, Avro, et cetera. So my conclusions for you, many data platforms are viable today. Get the platforming right. Start with a data store type, placement, and workload architecture. That narrows it down right there. You're going to have a handful instead of a whole army of possibilities at that point. Use the data profile as a strong determinant of the correct platform. Is it unstructured? How big is it? What's the frequency of that data, et cetera? Make sure it will perform now and for unspecified requirements. So you might want to get some help at looking ahead. Where are we, where are we probably going to go with this? So that I don't, want to, I don't want to undo what I'm doing right now in three years. It's too soon. So let's make sure we get into something scalable. Analytic platforms should be either staging, ODS, data warehouse, data mart, or Hadoop. Now, what I mean there is when you look across the spectrum of your analytic platforms, you should be able to label each one of them with one of these labels. And if you can, it's not playing a proper role because those are the proper roles for platforms in the analytic uh, e ecosystem. And finally, the cloud now offers attractive options with better economics, but there's different flavors of it, so you want to get into the right one. Information is the next natural resource. Our economy is entirely dependent upon it. 
it's just like sunshine. It's just like water. We need it. It's not going anywhere. It just keeps replenishing. We're not going to run out of it, but we may be overwhelmed by it if we don't get our data into the right platforms, which brings me to Shannon, and I think it's time for Q&A. William, thank you so much for this great keynote. Appreciate it as always. Um, if you have questions, submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section of your screen. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, we will be sending a follow-up email on Monday to all registrants with a unique login containing links to those slides and the recording of this sec of these sessions. Um, so, William, why is OPEX a pro? Is it is easier um, to have CapEx project approved than an OPEX project? Uh, did you say, is it easier to approve one versus the other? It, they are saying that it seems to be easier to approve CapEx versus OPEX. So why is OPEX a pro? I guess it would depend on the environment in, in terms of whether, uh, you know, which one is easier to approve. Um, as I get into the financing of a lot of these uh, options, um, I find that many companies, that they don't want to deal with the uh, oper uh, capitalizing the expenses, they would much rather operationalize them, and um, and this is sort of the the cloud model, right? You're going to pay as you go, and you're going to be able to expense it as you go, as opposed to large capital outlays at the beginning, and and it being over thresholds that make you put that on your on your finance financials. Uh, over the course of years, some sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's nine. Depends on a lot of different factors, but I know all my clients are pushing me to operationalize uh, expenses as much as possible. Um, and I guess that's just sort of the mindset we have going forward, trying to bring things in line uh, with uh, you know the, the quarterly uh, idea. And so, um, yeah, it just makes a lot of sense that way. And and if you look at software. Beyond platforms, I know we talk about platforms here, but if you look at software, software is really going the same way in terms of their their new pricing models. So um, I think it's just something worth that we need to get used to. You know, and um, William, but this presentation is really, you know, it's, it's talked a lot about medium and big business and not necessarily micro and small business, but for micro and small, a data store is usually decided by application. Do you have comments on that? I think that um, uh, that's a that's a good observation. I think that a lot of what I had to say uh, may be overkill for a small company, but the principles are probably still true, uh, still hold true. They just may not have as many platforms ultimately as a mid-sized to a larger company. They still compete on data. They still need to platform data appropriately within their budget, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, that's a good observation. I mean, they're not all going to be uh, you know, maybe deploying in memory databases or even deploying Hadoop, you know, I, at least not today. I'm, this this, uh, this presentation is about making a selection today. This isn't a futuristic kind of presentation where, uh, you know, 10 years from now, we really don't know what the platforming possibilities are going to be. We can come back and have this presentation. It'll look, it probably will look, will look quite different. But we're, nonetheless, we're making decisions for today. And small businesses need to do the same thing and um, have all the same criteria in place whether they know it or not. Great. And, you know, what about trust of public cloud, the control of your data? Yeah, I mean, that's that's number, number one or two uh, consideration uh, as people think about the public cloud. Uh, there's the trust factor, you know, will my data be secure? We need data to not only be secure, we need to be compliant. And one of the things that you get with a private cloud is you get control over that data. You know that it's not going to be, uh, you know, on a whim. Oh, let's, uh, let's store that data over here in a different country, which, would, which, for example, which would obviously big problem, be a big problem today. Uh, so, um, but I think trust in the public crowd, cloud is growing in terms of the security aspects. I think occasionally the availability of the public cloud takes a black eye, but if you look at it in context, you got to you got to consider the cloud in context with your in-house capabilities, and are they truly any better when it comes to even trust, 
even trust. Is it truly any better? And that's, those are some of the things that you have to look at. Is it truly better performing? Are you truly more compliant in-house versus in the public cloud? Sometimes it, when you really look at that equation, you find the answer is no. William, thank you so much. That's perfect. It brings us right to the end of this session. Um, and, but I'm afraid that is all we have time for. And thanks uh, so much to you and for sponsoring. And thanks to all of our other sponsors who have made today possible. We now have a 10-minute break where we encourage you to network with each other as you hear us get the next speaker set up. The next session will begin at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time where we will hear Tim Berglund talk about graph theory you need to know. William, thank you again so much. And thanks to our attendees for joining us so far. It's been a great event so far. Thank you, William. Thank you.